Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ajayta Shah, and I'm the founder and CEO of Frontier Markets. Uh, who uh, We are a last mile distribution company of clean energy solutions in India. And um, I have the privilege today to actually moderate what I think is going to be a great conversation amongst three, uh, amongst, I guess, all of us being uh, really uh, effective entrepreneurs that have been working on the ground in a very important area of combining the understanding of where energy plays a role when it comes to disaster relief, when it comes to women's care, when it comes to life. So when we talk about life and crisis management, we're going to get to hear today about some very interesting perspectives, solutions, challenges on what it's like to incorporate energy access as an important, if not mainstream or sole role when it comes to responding to crisis relief and also looking at women's care. So I'm going to quickly take a chance to um, I'll first introduce our panelists, and then I'll tell you my perspective on this. And I'd love to then really gauge our three um, incredible entrepreneurs on the panel to give their experiences in the work that they've been doing in the context of this and why they're here. Um, and then we'll start getting into a much more, I think, deeper dialogue of our own frustrations in terms of you know trying to do the work that we're doing, and hopefully be able to give a message to this audience um, to spread the awareness of uh, efforts that we're working on right now, especially given. Nepal as an earthquake, uh, as a crisis, um, and also thinking through some of the work about, you know, I think a lovely thing that you pointed out earlier, Laura, was that it's not just about the immediate response, but it's the long-term response and how do we make sure we're continuing to engage um, the efforts that we're working on, um, and then of course engage that broader audience. So I'm going to start from my right and move forward. So uh, we have Andy Moon, who is the uh, CEO of Sun Farmer who's been doing some pretty um, amazing work with health clinics, I believe, um, empowering health clinics through solar. Um, and I believe you've been um, doing this primarily in Africa, is that correct? Or uh, so, so we're a solar, Nepal yeah, and, yeah. We're a solar energy company focused on providing um, affordable and reliable solar, so electricity for health clinics, but also farms, schools, and other institutions. So more um, infrastructural. Yeah, infrastructural, exactly. Infrastructure, yeah, so infrastructure. We, we work on larger projects. Right. Um, our first country of focus is Nepal. Uh, so right now we're actually doing both energy, our energy business as well as disaster relief and looking to expand uh, very quickly to Southeast Asia. That's great. Um, so thanks so much. So I'm sure we have like, some great stories to hear from you, especially on the women's and healthcare perspective, but then also looking at, of course, disaster relief since Nepal is really the topic at hand right now. Um, and then we have uh, Sally, uh, Sally Bolton, uh, who's with Copernic. And Copernic, I believe, has been playing actually a quite active role in the last couple of years in disaster relief, very specifically, uh, looking at everything from Japan to the Philippines to um, all like hands on. I think I mean you've been a part of how many disaster reliefs now? Um, in terms of responding to six disasters six. In, in the Asia region, and and, and you've been months. primarily uh, really working on bringing in technology solutions like more to solar lanterns and mobile chargers to really respond quickly uh, in terms of the efforts to get these on the ground. So it'd be great to get a chance to hear your perspectives of how your model actually worked in terms of partnering with folks on the ground, but also some of the challenges of really getting people to agree that solar is a priority when it comes to disaster relief areas. So looking forward to hearing your, your, your thoughts on that. And then of course, last but not least, we have uh, Laura Sashel, who's with We Care Solar. And We Care Solar has been doing a lot of work specifically, again, in health crisis and management of, maternal and maternal health care specifically. Um, and I think, and, and how many areas are you working in now? Well, we've introduced things into 27 countries. We have about a thousand health right. facilities that have been equipped with our solar suitcases. And so the solar suitcase, I remember myself, because I know it's something that we've all talked about. We've talked about like why solar suitcase is such a, a revolutionary combination of looking at you know a, a box solution, but at the same time, that's relevant for power sources. And you're talking about areas where, you know, um, given the 27 countries that you've been working in, and we know some of them because we've heard a lot of stories in the past of why a quick solution for power relief is so important when it comes to maternal care. And so it'd be um, uh, great to get to hear some nightmares when the suitcase didn't exist and some great stories about why it did exist and you know what some of your experiences have been also of looking at how, why maternal health care doesn't kind of disappear when it comes to crises and why, if anything, you have to emphasize it even further because infrastructure is gone in these areas. So I'm um, looking forward to hearing from you. Um, so as you can see, we have a fantastic panel ahead of us. Um, I just wanted to start off with maybe a simple story from our own perspective um, and why I was excited to be um, moderating this panel is that, you know, uh, for a very long time, and especially in the UN uh, Sustainable Energy for All group, we've been talking about why energy access no longer needs to be a standalone vertical, where actually it's becoming 
you know, the kind of central thread that links all different sectors, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, whether it's crisis management, whether it's looking at power. And so when you think about the importance of power, it, it relates to a lot of the areas that we, as a sustainable development goal, um, have prioritized. So when we think about women and maternal care, uh, for a very long time, energy wasn't talked about. Suddenly we're talking about why power is so important in clinics, why power is so important in healthcare in general, why it's so important to even look at clean cook stoves and things that we're trying to distribute as we're thinking about women, children, and healthcare. The disaster crisis area is becoming more and more, unfortunately, a reality, but also we're a, a place where I think energy access can play a very strong role. Because as we're looking at more and more disasters happening, we're realizing one of the biggest things that happen are power cuts. And when power cuts happen, infrastructure gets killed. You can't call anyone on a cell phone. Your towers are gone. You don't have access to any sort of lighting. You have no access to power to even have anything function on a regular quarter core basis. And unfortunately, the sector hasn't really been driven in that direction. We have entrepreneurs that have been trying to push in that area, but we're trying to find minds at a larger issue. So this is also, again, another number one priority. So with that, uh, you know, in mind, you know, I'd love to understand, you know, from each panelist, uh, your specific experiences. So Andy, um, first shed us a little bit more light on, you know, what you've been doing in terms of healthcare clinics and schools and infrastructure. And, you know, when we first, when you first started looking at this model, how easy was it for you to get buy-ins into the healthcare sector or the ed education sector to say that like, oh yes, obviously a solar solution is what we need essentially. And then, um, and maybe we kind of do a round in that first, and then we'll go into uh, crises after. Sure. So I, I mean, I think everybody is very, very excited about solar. I think, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times uh, solar has somewhat been oversold. People, developing countries or stakeholders view it as a silver bullet, and that it'll be very, very cheap and will provide, uh, you know, electricity 24 hours per day. Um, and I think, unfortunately, the track record has, uh, has not been so good. I mean, in many places in India and in Africa, uh, you see a lot of health clinics or hospitals or other infrastructure that has solar panels, but often it's not working. Um, and that's something we've seen time and time again. And so that's really a, a lot of what we've tried to do for our, for our customers is really um, you know, be the one-stop shop where they can they can have a solar system that they can trust yeah. um, and make sure that it's something that will run for, you know, solar panels should last for 20 years, batteries should last for five. Um, but all too often, you know, after six or 12 months, uh, the systems are not working. Do you find that the health clinics and the schools that you've been installing your solutions in, they've been uh, from day one very proactively wanting solar solutions, or did you have to convince them that solar plays a role in the you know healthcare sector? Yeah, so so definitely. I mean, to be just very candid, I think uh, you know for us, we have to find really good partners because we're not our team is not health experts; we're experts in energy, and so um, you know we can't control if if a uh, you know, health clinic administrator chooses to only work for two hours a day, or if uh, if health outcomes are not good at that at that facility, we really need good partners where we believe somebody will um, you know will, will look after the, the clinic and actually make sure that the that the system will properly be utilized. And so, one of the problems we've seen is a lot of oversized systems where you get um, you know a, a gigantic gold plated solar energy system that's then you know used for just, just for lights. So uh, that's also another thing we don't want to see. So. So for us, I mean, quite frankly, it has been very difficult to find actually really good clients in, in health and education. Um, I, I do believe that for this to really scale up in a way that's meaningful, I think it's very important for, for, for the big donors and for governments to be involved as well. Uh, because I think, you know, doing the piecemeal sort of one, one at one at a time sort of projects, um, you know, we've been lucky to find some great partners, some great uh, NGOs that do wonderful work and, and have been able to to work with them and they highly value the, the services that we bring. But, uh, but if we really want you know, every, you know, 5,500 clinics in Nepal, the vast majority of those are public clinics. Um, you know, we do need strong involvement from the government as well as from, from donors as well. Um, thanks for that. Um, and we'll, we'll get into crisis um, after this, but, you know, I wanted to just turn this over to Karnik and because, you know, you mentioned that uh, of the product basket that you also um, push, you push cook stoves as well. And you talk, um, and, and, you know, knowing a bit more, so we're going to take a step back from the crisis management for a second and know mm -hmm. that your, your background generally has been working a lot with very different types of sectors of customers and the product basket issue. So what's been your experience in that? And how do you see that relating into healthcare women and of course understanding the, solution, the solutions that you've been introducing? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we take a fundamentally demand-driven approach mm -hmm. to, to making these technologies available. Um, we want to bridge the gap between the people who are producing these great, innovative, affordable technologies and the people who need these technologies the most. And often there's a huge gap that needs to be bridged there. So we put together a catalogue of around about 70 different technologies mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, and then we work on uh, making sure that uh, local organisations know that these technologies exist and then they can choose which technology is going to best serve the needs of their communities. Outside of emergencies, they're distributed, uh, you know, sold, money's repaid and reinvested, so it becomes a revolving technology fund. And then in the case of emergencies, uh, the technologies are given away for free because the need is so great. Have you, can you, can you give us some examples of, uh you know, so you must understand the segmentation of the customer base pretty well. So if we, if we look at uh, women and their needs, um, have they been embracing solar? Do you think it's an important part of who they are in terms of their development and children? And, 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 and how do you see that forming in terms of going forward as far as like your partners that are responding to this? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, women have definitely been embracing solar, um, but it's interesting to see when we introduce technologies, uh, women, you know, the, will ask a group of people to vote on which technologies they mm -hmm. want the most. And women will often be divided between cook stoves and water filters and solar. They'll see benefits from having access to all of those technologies, whereas men will always vote for the solar products. The solar products, okay. Because they right. don't understand kind of the, the time that goes into, you know, collecting wood to right. fuel a fire, for right. example, or the time that goes into waking up at 5 a.m. to boil water right. so your family can save water to drink. Right. No, that's great. I mean, that's great to hear. And I'd love to dive again more into the crisis uh, relief work that you've been doing because it's excellent. I mean, you've been doing it for so many years. Um, you know, going to Laura, I mean, how did you come up with the solar suitcase first? And, and, and what was the need? And, and, and give us some stories, you know, in terms of people using that solar suitcase versus, you know, what they were doing before and what your experience. When you were first asked about the role of um, electricity and maternal health care, yeah. and I mentioned that I'm an obstetrician, and I was invited to work in northern Nigeria to do research on maternal mortality in 2008, and I went to a state hospital that was delivering 150 women every single month, and despite the fact they were connected to the grid and they had a generator, at least 12 hours a day they were totally in darkness yeah. without electricity. And what that translated into as far as patient care, it meant that there was no way to have reliable lighting for the operating theater. They couldn't use the suction machine when they wanted to. They couldn't use a cautery device to coagulate blood vessels in the operating room. They didn't have lighting to start IVs, to write notes, to do deliveries, to do neonatal resuscitations. There was no way to power a blood bank refrigerator so that women who came in bleeding to death could not immediately get a blood transfusion. At the time that I arrived at the hospital, there were three to eight maternal deaths every single month. This was despite the fact that they had a full complement of physicians. They also had a full complement of midwives. They had operating room support. But even though there were a lot of investments in maternal health care, you can't leverage those if you're in darkness and without power for half of each day. When we brought in solar electricity to that hospital, which was solar power for the operating theater, we brought in a blood bank refrigerator, we brought in power for the maternity ward and for the labor room, the death rate went down by 70%. Yeah. And I just called them last week, which is now several years later, just to see how things were going. They said there have been no maternal deaths in the last three months. And that was unheard of. Um, so I think one thing that's really important is that Anything that's involved in healthcare is going to require visualization. It also requires communication. You need to be able to call people and call ambulances when you have health. And when there's no power, there's no way to power up cell phones or other mm -hmm. forms of communication as well. So I think it's one of those necessary but not sufficient elements of healthcare. If you have electricity, and as Andy was saying, if you don't have health staff, if people aren't there, you're not going to be able to save lives but you can't expect people, even very well-trained people, to provide life-saving care if they're literally in the dark in yeah. parts of each day. Yeah, absolutely. Now that's, I mean, I mean, I think that's just such a clear-cut point, and I think that this is where, um, I think SC for All also, we're, as, 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 a, as a practitioner as a network, we're trying to take a larger role in creating that message that as we start thinking about healthcare goals for the next five years, we need to make sure that we're improving power as a part of that goal, and, I, and you know, um, I so we do a lot of work in, in in India, and 
you know, watching a midwife deliver a baby under a kerosene lantern is just really scary. And I and I always compare that to like my sister had just delivered a baby like a year and a half ago, and she was you know at Cornell Hospital. And when you think about all the machinery that she's using to say, I mean, we're all the same people. So imagine like having no power or the power being cut even for five minutes is, you know, it's a it's a life or death situation. I think that unfortunately we're facing that a lot. And we're not realizing the importance of the power. Um, there, uh, but it is—it's an interesting. What's what's very clear about this conversation is that it's about uh, cross collaboration. Uh, clearly, where it's about proper interest in the healthcare system, proper understanding and utilization of facilities that are there, and then of course being able to provide power to that. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, and focus a little bit more on uh, disaster relief and crisis management. So, you know, last couple of years. Or not even last, I mean, this has been forever, but I guess for, for our sake, um, the last couple of years, we've all been witnessing um, an insane amount of climate change reactionary disasters on the ground, whether it's typhoons, whether it's earthquakes, whether it's tsunamis. And, you know, there's a clear, uh, you know, mentality to respond and aid overall in the sector, right? People quickly want to gather funds. They want to quickly create presidential funds, and they all want to quickly get medicine out there. They want to get food out there. They want to get people out there. Um, but you know, for a very long time, there really hasn't been this push to say, okay, we also need to get power out there. Yet, even though we know in all of these locations, there have been clear cut power cuts, and there have been clear disasters of what we've witnessed in terms of people's security, in terms of the infrastructure needs that are there, and even being able to connect and communicate, right? And so, um, I think all of you have played a pretty significant role, uh, or all of us have played a pretty significant role in wanting to really push for energy access uh, initiatives in disaster relief. And I'd love to uh, kind of get a little bit more feedback from you in terms of your experiences of what you've done, uh, what's worked, and of course, what have been some of the challenges that we see as a sector to scale this. And to just give you a quick example, we've only, I guess, as, a, as an organization became uh, properly set up to do uh, disaster crisis management uh, only around the Jammu Kashmir floods. Um, and uh, this was actually coming from the government. The government said, yes, we need 30,000 lights, like ASAP with mobile chargers. And when we asked them why, they said it's a security threat. There's no power, there's power outages and people can't find each other. So as we aggregated this campaign, uh, we again, at cost, tried to really deliver these products fast. We got a cargo partner, we got a ground partner, we had everything set up. But it took us a long time to get those lights together. And a lot of the reason was that people were like, well, the priority is food, the priority is medicine, the priority is not lights. Like, we don't really understand where lights fit in. That's a secondary or tertiary need. So um, that was really shocking and surprising to me. And I think it's been a really frustrating uphill battle. Uh, and, you know, we'd love to understand, you know, the work that you're doing, especially you, Andy. I mean, given that you're smack dab in Nepal right now, you know, what has been uh, your efforts and, and, and support that you've been getting and trying to do the work that you do, and how's that been affecting all of you? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, we, we actually had a lot of debate as to how we could best respond um, to this disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not a disaster relief organization, right. and that's not something that we've done in the past. But that being said, you know, we have an engineering team that's that's, that, that's all Nepali, they're based based in Nepal, um, and they live there, and so they're, they're sort of living through this through this situation. And uh, I mean, what's been amazing is uh, the amount of energy and support that we've gotten. I mean, our team is actually everybody's still sleeping outside uh, in their cars or in their tents because they're afraid the buildings will fall and come and do. Um, so they're still uh, not even back at their homes, but they're they're still going to the office and actually ready to to help because there are, there are so many villages right outside of. Kathmandu that have been completely destroyed. That's not what you see much on the news. Uh, most of it's focused on on, on, on Kathmandu itself. But um, you know, in a couple of dis the districts where we're uh, heavily involved, uh, Gorka, Dadin, um, Sindhu Palcho, you know, 90 or 100 health clinics have been completely destroyed. 90 to 95 percent of homes are flattened or unlivable, uh, and that's a story at probably about 25 out of 75 districts in Nepal at the moment. So um, you know, given uh, so there has been some issues because Nepal has only one international airport. And it, right. it can't take the, the, the heavier planes. So uh, there is a very limited supply channel coming in. Uh, the roads on the western side, many are completely destroyed. So getting goods even from India to Nepal um, is not, it's not clear how those goods, goods will roll in. So as far as like a first response, we procured just 1,300 uh, solar lanterns uh, that were available locally in Kathmandu through our suppliers and have started distributing those 
um, to mainly women and pregnant women in the hardest hit districts. Um, we are very interested in being involved in the long-term reconstruction of rebuilding the Kapal. So we have, we'll be installing at least 80 small, um, small charging stations and electricity systems, uh, but also are really looking forward to working with uh, the government of Nepal, yeah. um, possible health, and other, um, you know, other local institutions to build back these health clinics. I mean, there's, there will be hundreds of health clinics that need to be rebuilt from scratch because the structure is completely, completely gone. So, um, so we're looking to partner together and really build, uh, build the clinics a lot better than they were ever built before. Um, so, in, you know, in some ways, this is uh, an opportunity for all of us to collaborate and to, to really, um, you know, come together and, and build something with the support of the government. This is not something that I think international NGOs can, 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 can take the lead on because it's important to have a strong government sector Absolutely. Uh, and, and really, you know, involve the government and have them, have them lead us along and, yeah. and we'll provide expertise where, uh, where we can. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, I think that's a really bad point. I mean, we, we we thought we would be able to access Nepal as easily as we did JNK because we really do have partners and presence everywhere. But just with that one fact of the fact that you, we can't get cargo troops, I mean, we're connected with the army. We can't even get the army right. trucks down to cross borders to get to Nepal right now, which has really been really, really tough. And then you know, we have partners that are kind of like source products more to us. We're like, how do we like, physically get it to you? They're like, walk. I was like, okay, maybe we could, we could, we could probably walk with backpacks on and get new products. But like, I mean, um, I think that's been challenging. Did you find that, like, in terms of looking at even uh, supply chain, yep. uh, priority wise, yes. right? So if you're thinking about these plans that are coming in, um, are is there space for solar products, or do you think it's you know still you're still kind of needing to do some sort of convincing? Yeah, there's that yeah, is a priority. Definitely convincing because I think the heavier uh, the the international airport cannot cannot take the heavier planes. Right. Um, because the runway will actually break, right? And so that's been that has been an issue. Um, right. And so, I mean, luckily, you know, we work with a lot of local partners. We partner with the largest solar companies in Nepal, and so they have a lot of supply of panels mm -hmm. and batteries already in the country. And that's what we're focused on right now. Um, one thing I'll say is we've been shocked by all the, or not shocked, but uh, very pleased with all the generosity of many of com companies in the energy sector. Mm -hmm. So Sun Edison has donated over twenty uh, solar systems, two hundred. 250 watts each to us. Uh, Northland Power has donated 10. Simpson Networks has donated 50, uh, 40 watt systems. Uh, Silver Spring Networks has, has been fundraising. So there's a lot of folks that are very, very generous. Um, it will take some time for those things to come into the country. And uh, you know, I think I think even though right now is the time for us to make sure everybody's aware and that that we're, you know, everybody is still top. The ball is still top of mind because this this will get buried uh, under the rest of the the media. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any day now, but uh, or maybe already has. But um, no, well, you have you have a lot of friends in the media that are working really yeah. hard. So yeah. there's uh, there's a lot of people that are doing a lot of crowd. I mean, right. crowdfunding is right. playing a huge source, and this Malak has like yes. aggregated right. all of us together. Right, right. So we're all just kind of going. Let's just use our sources to get money pulled together. Who cares what the product is right now? Right. Let's just get right. that money together so we can. So you'll get like another three thousand likes in the next like four days. So <laughs> yeah. So uh, but yeah, but that's great. So I, I want to yeah, I yes, actually yes. <laughs> uh, move move to move to a lot of your efforts that you've been working on actually because I mean this is not your first but you've been doing multiple. So I'd love to hear your experiences and how what you've been focused on and how you've been getting this out there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's interesting to hear you say that we have a lot of experience because we still feel like we're pretty young sure. in, in this area. Um, Copernic launched in 2010, um, and uh, our CEO is from Japan. So he spent, you know, the first year of the organization just going out, rallying support from as many people as possible in Japan to make these simple solar technologies available in the developing world. And then all of a sudden, in March 2011, massive earthquake and tsunami struck Japan. And then people in Japan were like, hey, we actually need these technologies ourselves to recover from an emergency. And since then, we've had a huge supporter base in Japan um, who have uh, continued to donate and rally support for subsequent emergencies, which we've responded to, including volcanic eruptions, flooding, the typhoon in the Philippines, and now the earthquake in Nepal. Um, so it feels like there's this momentum building, uh, right. that, that there's growing recognition that energy is really important in crisis situations. Have you been able to connect with the governments on this? Because I think the point that Andy was making was really valid, right? Like that, um, you know, we can do our donor, private sector, NGO efforts, but if you're talking about long-lasting, larger, um, you know, instrumental effects, um, and especially because it is a state crisis or a country crisis, um, 
as you've been doing the work that you've been doing, do you feel like your partners are more outside of the government? Has the government started paying attention to this? Like where where do you see? Yeah, I don't I don't feel like there has been a lot of connection to the government. But I think the really important uh, role that we can play is uh, is making sure the government uh, knows which technologies are sure. going to serve yeah. community needs in these situations, making sure that it's not kind of cheap, low quality products that are right. going to break really quickly, but um, that they're aware of kind of the quality standards yeah. that we work with. And I think that's a really important factor also. I think that, you know, when, when crisis uh, hit, unfortunately, it also creates a market opportunity for a lot of uh, I guess what's the right word, but uh, deviations from you know goal, like proper priorities, and so I think that's a really important point. And, and hopefully, what we can do as a platform, as a sector, push that as an agenda as well, saying that you know there is a difference between let's not just try to get the cheapest light out there, but let's make sure the light actually functions in terms of the, the crisis that we're actually at. So that's a really important. Please uh, share some of your your insights in terms of looking at your own experiences of. Where this actually again, I mean, you, you made a very interesting comment before we started the panel uh, about um, where, especially during moments of crises, maternal health care actually becomes much more important, and maternal is more long term need to look into that because it is an infrastructure play. And um, you know, in your experiences of looking at some of these things that happened in the last couple of months, years, um, do you find it being challenging to like focus on maternal care and solar, or do you think that? It becomes an obvious need because the infrastructure is gone during these crises. So, you know, clearly, I'm an obstetrician and I'm leading yeah. a solar and electric uh, right. nonprofit. So, right. I have figured some way to, to bridge the two. And I think right. that it's really artificial to have silos. I think if you're going to be working in countries that don't have good infrastructure, it's really important that you can really speak a lot of different languages. I think, to issues that you were just bringing up, Sally, as far as the quality, I think that's really especially important when you come to disaster relief. I'd say we learned a lot from our early experience in Haiti where we had sent out um, equipment that we thought was fine for being inside of buildings, not realizing that when they're in tents, they're going to be dropped, they're going to be in mud, they're going to be having rain on them, people can step on them. And so we actually made a much more rugged system exactly yeah. uh, to try and address a lot of the challenges that happen when you're working in places that don't have good infrastructure. It turned out that that's, those same design requirements were really good for long-term uses in rural health facilities. So if you think about designing things for places that are really hard to reach, a lot of the clinics that we reach in non-disaster areas can take 10 or 11 hours to reach you know, by a series of cars, canoes, and walking. And so once they get to that end location, we want them to last for a really long time. So I think that the um, application, application of just having really durable equipment is yep. going to serve both the immediate uh, needs as well as long-term needs. Um, I think the other types of considerations in designing equipment is that they need to be adaptable, as I mentioned, for tents, which means not having super heavy solar panels. Yep. Think about lightweight solar panels that can work on the top of tents, but then when the country is able to rebuild and, and clinics are able to be safe enough to enter, can those panels then be repurposed and put onto health facilities? And so that's one of the things that we're trying to do as well. I think another issue is that healthcare needs lighting throughout the night. So um, some of the small lamp products are terrific for individual use, but if a healthcare worker is relying on them, the fact that they're good for four hours or eight hours may not be good enough. If they need something that's going to be dependable, if they're in the middle of a C-section and the light goes out, that's a big problem. Um, so you really want a product that's going to be good every day and have light that lasts at least through the night as well. Um, I think the special appropriateness, though, is that in any of these countries where sun is available, it's a free source of fuel, and it's a much better solution than trying to ship in fuel um, to a lot of these places that yeah. may not be able to get fuel, or, for example, after the Philippines, a lot of fuel is contaminated, so they can use the fuel that they have. Um, but just speaking as far as maternal health issues, um, women don't get to choose at what time of day they're going to have a baby, and if they're already pregnant, they can't choose to do something different just because a crisis has occurred. So in Nepal, I believe there's 120,000 pregnant women right now. Um, so those women all need to be served, and in a lot of the countries that all of us are working in, there already was a fragile infrastructure for healthcare to begin with. And so what's happening is we're compounding a problem, and I read a really interesting article about um, looking at the Nepal um, disaster through the lens of gender 
And one of the things they talked about is how difficult it is even to get resources distributed in an equitable manner because women either who are pregnant or are caring for small children may not have the flexibility to even go and get relief resources. They're more restricted. They may be the same ones who are caring for elderly in the home. So there really are special vulnerabilities. They're also more at risk for things like rape, and so safety becomes a huge, a huge importance. So having lights just to try and protect people, I know that was a big issue in Haiti as well, where rape was an issue in a lot of the tent cities. Um, so I think, just like we're saying in many different ways, the immediate needs of women are really paramount. They may not always be on the front agenda. It may be hard to get things into some of these places when food, of course, is so very important and medicine is important. And so how do we equally prioritize the needs for energy, which we know is very important. But I, as I was telling you before the session started, we just had 40 of our solar suitcases bumped off a relief pain because there wasn't enough room once they put in the medicine and the food. So now we're waiting for weeks, even though we have equipment ready to go. Yeah, I mean, you said so, such, so many important things, and I think just, you know, I'll just respond to a couple of them. So on the design perspective, I absolutely agree with you. I think that all of us have had experiences working in rugged rural terrain. So actually, in, in, in design perspective, like we are starting to push things that are definitely much more uh, capable of running into the disaster areas as well. And I think that's a really important point and that really emphasizes the difference between our mindset of what we're creating versus what's out there in the market for like a quick opportunity, you know? Um, so I have this like 3D printed image product here for a reason because, um, so I've been in distribution forever and it's really never been my goal to create a product. But having worked in India and with farmers for the last like five and a half years and constantly trying to work with manufacturing companies that like just don't get them and they're constantly telling you what they want, but they're not willing to design it, I got frustrated and I was like, all of us uniquely with our experiences can design things that are much more relevant to the need on the ground. So this was a, you know, it's a high beam fox light torch, which is a kilometer distance of light, uh, which lasts for 12 hours, because you're absolutely right, lights need to last for more than four to eight hours, depending on crises. They need to be waterproof, they need to be lightweight, they need to be rugged and resistant. And so we just weren't finding this in India, we weren't finding this in China, like it, and we couldn't find it at the right price points. We finally said, forget it, let's get an OEM, let's design it ourselves, and then let's add a panel to it so it actually can function properly. So, you know, um, this now has become the number one disaster relief product for everyone, because everyone needs fox lights when they're going into disaster relief, and it has to be waterproof if you're dealing with floods and typhoons. And I think that those kind of things are really important. And um, so we all have actually an ability to really give our insights as to what our rural experiences are, rugged experiences are, and where they kind of apply into disaster relief. So I really do appreciate that a lot. And I think that the emphasis on women, I mean, it was a very embarrassing conversation to have with the J&K government when I had to try to convince them that women getting raped is a reality during uh, floods and crisis and blackouts. And that, you know, and then he was trying to like, it, compare that to the value of food. And I found myself actually saying this, and I know this is being tweeted everywhere, so it's gonna be interesting, but I find myself saying that, you know, a person can survive without food for three days. But if a person's instantly vulnerable to something like rape, there's no time, right? It can happen within minutes. And the after effect of not eating for three days versus being raped how do you compare those two things, right? And it was it was like that moment where he looked at me eye to eye and he goes, oh, and I go, so it, I'm not saying don't bring food. I'm saying understand that beyond food, there's also very important issues that we're not understanding that are these causal, there are these effects of going through such crises. And and how do we, in, as, as, as a community, understand the sensitivity behind that in a deeper way? So I, I appreciate uh, that comment as well. Um, so I know we have about like, five minutes. Uh, so um, I'd love to kind of just maybe open this up more for you, uh, you know, given your experiences, what is the one thing, I mean, given that we are here for the Sustainable Energy for All conference, we're here, we're having these amazing discussions about the next five years plans of where we're trying to go with uh, the work that we're doing in energy access and, you know, what we've achieved to this point. How do you all feel, because you've all been in the space for long enough, um, in terms of where we've come with the work that you're doing, and where do we need to go? And and what and I know we alluded to this a little bit, but maybe these are like final statements. What would you like to see happen to be able to be more successful in what we're doing? So I think my the thing I like to say is I think uh, you know there's an important space for energy service companies. I think that it's important for donors as well as for governments to really 
take a look at the long term long term view. Um, I think historically there's been a lot of very short term, uh, short sighted uh, policies as well as just implementations of solar energy systems. And I think one direct example is you know so many countries have subsidy programs where they just provide a bulk subsidy of 75, 80 percent of a system cost up front. And what happens is there's always low quality stuff that gets installed and you know, 80% is 80% on paper, but that's actually probably 110% of the actual cost. So vendors just go in and get their profit on day one, and then the thing breaks after after yeah. a couple months. And it happens all the time, and it continues to happen, even with money that's from uh, major you know major donors and major agencies. And that that problem will continue as long as those those are the policies. So I think you know, similar to what we did in the U.S., um, the U.S. solar market went from an upfront subsidy program going. Um, uh, production-based subsidy, and, and that's had a transformative impact on the quality of solar energy projects in the United States as well. And so I think, you know, having donors taking a long-term view and like instead of just trying to get the money out the door by the end of the fiscal year, really looking at three, five, ten-year, ten-year view and, and making sure that the systems are working over the long term is, is so important because solar is extremely expensive if it breaks yeah. <laughs> in yeah. a year. Um, so yeah, that's great. Thank you. So. Um, uh, so the question was, where, where are we going? Where yeah, we're I mean, we're, you know, given the number of years that you've been mm -hmm. working on this in this space, uh, given your experiences, you know, what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think you've achieved mm -hmm. so far and what are you hoping, what would you ideally like to see improve mm -hmm. uh, to be able to be more, to be able to continue being mm -hmm. successful in the work that you're doing? Um, I mean, for us, it's all about developing sustainable supply chains to reach remote communities. Mm -hmm. um, and in the case of Nepal, we've been really lucky to be working with the power generation in Nepal, mm -hmm. who had their teams on the ground to, you know, had their stock of solar lights, which they were very quickly able to then uh, mobilise the resources to be able to get those out very soon after the earthquake. Um, so that definitely helps in, in responding to the emergency very quickly. What and help the, do you need for sustainable supply chain? <laughs> We're out there. Let's let these people know. So, what do we? What do we? What do we need? What do you need? Uh, flexible financing. Okay. Okay. So, I would say keys to success really have to do with partnerships, mm -hmm. so that there are people who are part experts in energy, and those who are experts in health, and those who are experts in supply chains, and there's investors, and so really, it's going to take a lot of people working together in partnership to make this success, and they totally agree that we need to be look, be, look beyond gig products into the hands of those who need them, but how do we keep things working so that we're not leaving another legacy of failed solar yeah, electric absolutely. systems and everything else absolutely. that we are all aware of in these countries. Well, great. Um, so I think that, uh, I think that was really well summarized, we said, you know, we need finance, we need partnerships, we need quality products, we need governments to understand all of this and respond to us in a more productive partnership way, and we also need uh, everyone to understand that actually energy access really does in fact play a really important role when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to life, when it comes to women. And, and I think that um, as we start seeing unfortunate more crises come about, or as we start really starting to understand how to help empower more women, or think through the reality of where energy plays a role in life, uh, Folks like people here on this table, uh, you know, can use that support, and um, and I think that as a sector, we can just move a lot further, knowing that. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you.